food with no deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> and I based this all on Jim, because when he was live, we had an offer, come on Buick, light my fire. No. And it was a lot of money, and we were young, and we were like, wow. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And, and, and I'll go on television, and we can do an ad where I smash the car with a sledgehammer. <laughs> Guess we're not doing that. So, um, this is, uh, it's, uh, it's self-explanatory. It's the weekend. I need a break from all this linear thought that lawyers seem to love. Music will be just here, so I'm on my way to the Inglewood Forum in California to see Tom Petty's band. I love their music, and especially love Tom's dedication to his fans. He has a ceiling on his ticket prices and allows no VIP section in the front for execs who don't really care about the music. He said, I don't want the real fans in the nosebleed section. So this evening will be a good anecdote to the pressure I've been under during this trial. I take my seat to Mrs. Jackson Brown, who is opening for Tom Starts his set. Now there's a guy whose integrity sits directly on his shoulders for everybody to see. He know, uh, he's known for his philanthropy, but to me, that word has an arrogant ring to it. The Greek's translation of philanthropy is literally loving people. But I'd rather call someone an altruist with deep pockets. Jackson Brown is one of the best examples of the true definition of philanthropy, an active effort to promote human welfare. Most people would agree that helping others gives us the greatest satisfaction. It's in our nature, but most of us are just educated wrong. Jackson has a PhD in this area. His heart is so open you can almost see his caring nature running through his veins. In the audience, I find myself sitting next to Jim Ladd, a legendary Los Angeles rock disc jockey who is an old friend. He tells me he's going to introduce Tom Petty, and I get an idea. You see, Tom's latest album is called The Last DJ, and the title cut is about Jim Lamb, the very guy sitting next to me. The song tells a story about how, as a result of the corporate takeover of a radio station, the disc jockeys were ordered to stick to a dictated playlist, but the last DJ wouldn't tell the line. And in real life, that was exactly what Lamb did. When the corporate heads threatened to fire him, if he wouldn't play the music they wanted him to play, he said, fine, I'll take my fans with me. The station back down is the day he's the only freeform DJ left doing his thing, playing whatever he feels like in the moment. Hey, Jim, what if I introduce you before you introduce Tom? I said, genius grin. His eyes lit up. During an intermission, we go backstage and run the idea by the promoter and it's a go. I'm standing in the wings, waiting for my cue to walk out in front of 14,000 petty fans, already frothing at the mouth, and they're stamping their feet and making a lot of noise, the reason they know Tom cares about them. There's another song on the new album, Money Becomes King, which also is one of the reasons I'm here. It's got some dedicated fans who become disillusioned with their hero because he starts doing light beer commercials and can't remember the original lyrics. <laughs> this particular song reminds me of the Who's Peter Townsend interview in Rolling Stone magazine where he challenged, he is challenged by reporter Chris Heath for lis, uh, lis licensing his songs for various commercials. Heath. Uh, there are a few interesting uses of the Who's catalog at the moment. I thought it was strange that you let them use bargain in the Nissan car ad, given that the song is so very much not about that. Townsend. Yeah, but not many people know that. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, correct me if I'm interpreting it wrong, but the song is saying that you are prepared to give yourself up for enlightenment or spiritual satisfaction, and that this is the bargain, it's the best you've ever had. That's right, yeah. <laughs> what, what, which is about as anti-materialistic a message as one can think of. So what's your point? <laughs> uh, uh, my point is that it's now being used to sell shiny new motor cars. I still don't get your point. You haven't completed the argument. Well, uh, I'll complete it then. Uh, the suggestion of the ad is that one might buy a super Nissan car, and that's the best one for the finest <laughs> 
surprised him. That's the bargain. Well, uh, that's their suggestion, isn't it? Who fans will often say, this is my song, it belongs to me, it reminds me of the first time I kissed Susie and you can't sell it. But the fact is that I can and I will and I have. I don't give a fuck about the first time you kiss Susie. Yeah. <laughs> the Who may have many more fans than Tom Petty, but they can't be as dedicated as this crowd, which swells to a roar when I'm introduced. I'm flattered. But I know it comes from the fact that besides admiring me, they now know that like them, I'm a petty fan. As Morrison wrote, music inflames temper. This crowd is on fire as I say, hello. I'm here to introduce the man who will bring out the band. Some call him the last DJ. They go nuts. And I bow to Mr. Ladd as he make, and make my exit. After he's introduced by Jim, while Petty rocks the house, I think about a number, number of artists who portray the other side of Pete Townsend's argument, the ones whose side of my belief that art is a gift shouldn't be entirely thought of as a commodity. Tom Waits, recently inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, for example, sent a very poetic letter to the editor following the publication of my article in The Nation, uh, which I wrote about this subject, so songs for ads. Tom says, Thank you for your eloquent rant by John Dixon <laughs> on the doors on the subject of artists allowing their songs to be used in commercials. I spoke out whenever possible on the topic, even before the Frito Lay case. It was uh, Waits versus Frito Lay. Uh, when they used a sound like version of my song, Skip Right Up. And it's so convincingly, I thought it was me. Uh, ultimately, after much trial and tribulation, we prevailed, and the court determined that my voice is my property. Songs carry emotional information and some transport us back to a poignant time, place, and event in our lives. It's no wonder corporations would want to hitch a ride on a spell these songs cast and encourage you to buy soft drinks, underwear, or automobiles while you're under their trance. Corporations are hoping to hijack the culture's memories for their product, and they want an artist's audience, credibility, goodwill, and energy the songs have gathered as well as given over the years and they suck the life and meaning from the songs and impregnate them with the promise of better life with the product. <coughs> Eventually, artists will be going on stage like race car drivers, covered in hundreds of logos, yes. sold in their costumes. John, stay pure, your credibility, your integrity, and your honor are things no company should be able to buy. Thank you, Tom. So the loyalty of the fans is palpable tonight as they demand several <coughs> reports from Tom Petty's band. My mind flashes back to the early days that every band goes through struggling to get a toehold in an ever-increasing difficult industry. I'm not saying that no rock song should ever be sold as commercial. Certainly a new group is out there struggling to pay the rent. They can get some help. But they should consider, once they get a toehold on success, um, that they might get stuck. Lewis High, in his seminal book, The Gift, says, that a work of art has to have a gift component or it will only be a commodity. He writes, even if we pay the price for, at the door of a museum or concert hall, when we are touched by the work of art, something comes to us which is, has nothing to do with the price. The Tom Petty show ends and Jim Ladd and I head to the dressing room to pay our respects. Tom was very gracious and a candid vibe was in the air. I remember reading about Tom having the same reaction I did when I heard Good Vibrations, a metaphoric song by the, in the 60s by the Beach Boys. I'm Tom, 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 Tom. It was selling orange press soda pop. I was crushed. What gift I felt I received about the message of love in the counterculture was doused by yellow dye number five. My flower power was wilting almost uh, dead from the onslaught of, onslaught of inorganic commerce and pesticides. One of Jim Morrison's gifts was to write lyrics that seemed to have universal meaning, though everyone got something a little different from the words, but I'm sure his intention wasn't to love me two times because I just took my anger. 
<laughs> Tom Petty, Jim Lamb, and I say goodbye, and I hit the road, and I get into my Prius, and I remember another letter I received in response to my Nation article. Makes me want to puke when I hear Jimi Hendrix selling Pontiacs. I can't believe Hendrix would ever have signed off on that. But Hendrix, like Morrison, died way too young, and evidently their heirs inherited only the rights and not his ideals. Morrison was luckier, and believe me, the fans do care. I pulled into my garage and just sat there for a few minutes. I can't stop ruminating on all this. The line in the sand I'm drawn has become a wall. I realize it's time to get off my butt and get into the house. Thank God the heirs of Dylan's deceased pal, Johnny Cash, had the sensibility not to okay the classic song, Ring of Fire, for an ad to cure him. <laughs> <laughs> May Johnny spend the burning rest in peace. <laughs> Yeah.